This episode is sponsored by Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. How do they do it? Like us, Girls Can Crate believes that real women make the best heroes. And every month they deliver them to your doorstep. Katie. Hi, Olivia. What's more important, happiness or great art? Oh, <laughs> for all of humanity or for me personally? <laughs> uh, both, I guess. Uh, I feel like I guess this is probably is something kind of... you guys have talked about at your house a bit. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> We're just preparing for a study abroad to Greece. It's called Ancient Greece and Human Happiness. Aha. And we're studying all the famous ancient Greek art and happiness. <laughs> hey. Okay. I guess for me personally, I'd say happiness. All right. What about humanity in general? Happiness. Yeah. Hmm. So if we could go back and make Vincent van Gogh happy, but he never paints anything. I know. Yeah. Do you do that? I, I'm just could be my mood right now but I feel like you can be happy and produce great art and so maybe oh. if Van Gogh was happy could have been just as incredible maybe more incredible ah. but what if he couldn't though yeah what if we know he couldn't I would accept a mediocre version of Vincent Van Gogh if he had lived a happy life Hmm. But what if the, his art makes other people happy? I know. So you're oh, reducing I all see. the happiness. Yes. Okay, so you just became a utilitarian saying... I was going to say yeah. utilitarianism says... Greatest common... Well, a greatest good for the greatest number. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Would you be a miserable artist to make other people happy? Would you sacrifice yourself in that way? No. And do you think other people should? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I guess, you know, broken hearts and all the garbage that happens to you, it does inspire deep emotions and like reaching out to humanity, you know? Yeah. Sharing that message that you're not alone. And it's pain that makes you do that. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that all of our favorite songs are breakup songs. Yeah. And Ugh. Well, that doesn't fit with the way I want the world to be. <laughs> Maybe the great art that unhappy artists produce is like a silver lining. I, I want to live in a world where you don't have to be unhappy to produce great art. Do we live in that Me too, world? And I believe that. Yeah. Can yes. we live in that world? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but... Ugh, I knew there was a but. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, could the woman that we're talking about today have created the work that she did if her life had been more what she had wanted it to be? I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. In 1996, a graduate student was walking through the stacks in the library. This graduate student named Mark Robson was helping the University of Leeds uh, create a digital catalog of all of their holdings. And he was, um, I'm building this into a mythos, but he was walking down the holdings and saw a manuscript on a shelf. And I think it was categorized improperly but when he investigated, he realized that it was this whole complete manuscript written by a woman that we'd never heard of. We didn't know this manuscript existed. And this manuscript of poetry and most of a novel from the 17th century is brand new. What? Every historian's dream just do to do oh, here's a 400-year-old manuscript. Oh, look, here's a brand new writer. <laughs> Did you guys know that this we was never here? knew existed? 
who wrote 130 folios of what? manuscripts. Seriously? 130 folios. 130 notebooks yeah. of writing. And no one knew she existed. Wow. This woman's name is Hester Poulter. And to learn more about her, I talked to Samantha Snively. My name is Samantha Snively. I write on experimentalism and experimentation in the 17th century, particularly focusing on women's manuscript recipes and household writing. So Hester Poulter is in my dissertation, but she's also exactly the kind of person that my project is all about uh, amplifying and giving more visibility to. So Dr. Samantha Snively works for UC Davis in their Office of Development and Alumni Relations. She's the social media manager and a contributor on the Poulter Project, huh. which is an amazing digital humanities. It's an online archive, but it's so much more. Mm. It's an online museum. Cool. There's so much cool stuff happening in digital humanities right now. It's awesome. This project is the future of digital humanities, of what you can do when you get everybody on the same page and mm. you have historians and literature people and technology specialists and scientists and everyone working together on the same project. It's really incredible. Cool. Hester Poulter was born in probably 1605. We don't know too much about her that is in public records. There are a couple of different accounts of when she was born, but our best guess is that she was born in 1605 in Dublin. And so this is, you know, the era of Shakespeare. So Hester was the eighth of 11 children, so she was born into a really big family. Her father became a counselor to James I a few years after she was born. So the family moved back to London and James, you know, left his law practice and became uh, a counselor in the royal court and was given an earldom. And so Hester, from a young age, was an earl's daughter. We don't know too much about her childhood because her mother died when she was very young, and then all records kind of vanish for a while. Um, but we know from her poems that she was really well educated, as daughters of, of nobility would have been in the time. She pops back on the map when she marries this guy named Arthur Poulter. They marry very young. In one of her poems, she says that she was 13. Of course, that's in a poem, so we have to treat it with a little bit of suspicion. But she was very young, and Arthur was very young. And that's, that's young even for the standards of the day. So it's very likely that Hester got married, in quotes, and then went to live with the Poulter family until she and her husband were old enough to form their own house. So just this month, an Australian scholar found Hester Poulter's marriage certificate, and so we now know that she was actually 15 when she married. Still very young. Mm -hmm. Arthur's an interesting figure in that we also don't know a lot about him. We know he went to Cambridge, he studied to be a lawyer, and then he went back to his house in the country to live a life of being a sheriff and talking with priests. He's notable for men of his day in that he never really participated in the government. Most nobility would have been expected to be in court or be in parliament, and he seemed to have been content just hanging out in his country estate, being a scholar. And so Hester went with him. They lived at Broadfield Hall in Hertfordshire, which is only 30 miles from London, so it's not too far. But in the 17th century, 30 miles from London would have been at least a day's journey. So Hester writes a lot about being isolated, being cut off from her family and from society. She had 15 kids in 24 years. Ooh. Only two of those children survived her. No. Oh. Almost all of them died either in childbirth or <gasps> in early childhood. Ugh. She writes a lot of poems about the perpetual grief mm. of losing child after child after child. And we, I think we don't have a reference point no. for that, mm -mm. really, in our society anymore. We can't even begin to comprehend yeah. what that feels like. Wow. Come, my dear children, to this lonely place, where Gray's cool, stupefying spring doth trace. Trust me, I think I of this fount partake. I am so dull, and such sad fancies make. Nor can the quintessence of Bacchus's liquor 
nor the elixir make my spirit quicker. Those gross extractions doth my thoughts annoy. Tis fasting, fancies are my soul's sole joy. When my freed soul flies to her place of birth, then am I brave, my foot then spurns this earth. My mind being raised above all these worldly jars, methinks I play at football with the stars. An excerpt from To My Dear Jane, Margaret, and Penelope Poulter, They Being at London, I at Broadfield. Grief and loss and pain and death were a huge part of her life and the lives of many other women at the time. Her family was in London, and so she saw them occasionally, but she didn't necessarily have that system of, of support and a, a, a community in which to process that. And that's all we know about her. Mm. Well, it's more than most women in the 17th century. Exactly. <laughs> she wrote things down. Yeah. Good job, Hester. <laughs> but all we know is from her poetry and her fiction. We don't have any life writing. Mm. We don't have any diary entries. They're personal poems. Mm -hmm. But we also want to be careful. I think in literature especially, we have a tendency to assume that women's writing is biographical mm -hmm. and that men's writing is philosophical. Yeah. And there's no reason to assume that these things she's writing are from her perspective and not from a character's perspective. Yeah. But stories like that of the of somebody just sauntering through a library and going, oh, I found a 400 <laughs> year old manuscript. That's that's what keeps so many history grad students going. That's what you dream of. Yeah. And then you don't find it. <laughs> and it's terribly yeah. disappointing. Yeah. But but I'd like to think that there are still lots more of those things. I mean, surely they're in people's attics and maybe even in libraries, too. There's got to be more yeah. out there. There have to be. So the manuscript is titled Poems Breathed Forth by the Noble Hadassus and The Sighs of a Sad Soul Emblematically Breathed Forth by the Noble Hadassah. So she writes about herself with this kind of pseudonym. Hadassah is the Hebrew word for Esther. She didn't, you know, sign it by Hester Poulter. So there's a little bit of cross-referencing that they, Mark Robson had to do, but he realized pretty quickly that this was a manuscript, uh, a complete polished manuscript by a woman that no one had ever heard of. And so it was a huge find. Scholars pick her up around 2013, 2014. I think the edition of poems comes out in 2014 and very rapidly goes out of print. And then only in the last couple of years with the Poulter Project have people begun to get interested in her. There are just a handful of articles. I think there might be one dissertation before me. So she's new. Most scholars in the field haven't yet heard of her. But now the Poulter Project is bringing it back. About half of her poems are online now <laughs> and new ones are going up constantly. Which has been really cool to see uh, how you bring the works of a poet no one has ever heard of to an audience that doesn't often have familiarity with 17th century women poets to begin with. So that's been a fascinating process. It looks a lot like an ebook, right? In an ebook, you'll have a text, you can pick pages, you can toggle on the Poulter Project back and forth between poems. But what's really cool about the Poulter Project is that it's not just the text. You can certainly enter, read her poem first, but then there are layers of interpretation and glosses and interesting facts built in. So there's what we call the elemental edition, which is sort of just her text with any archaic words explained. You can then flip into an amplified edition, which explains some of the context, explains some of the references she makes, Hester Poulter was a fan of the obscure reference, so there's a lot in her poems that even like scholars are like, what are you talking about? What Greek myth are you referencing? And so you can, you can add in th those layers of information. And then my favorite part of the project is that every poem will come with a set of what we call curations, and these are snippets of early modern life history texts that scholars bring together 
to create a broader picture of the world Hester was writing in. So for example, she writes this fantastically weird poem about a poison duel between a toad and a spider. It ends up being a moral about fighting in the court and why you shouldn't try to reach above your station. Apparently also why you shouldn't poison toads. And so the curations will include things like myths about toads, myths about spiders, but it will also include historical references that Hester is making. You know, she writes in the duel between the toad and the spider, she likens it to the duel between Mowbray and Bolingbroke in the reign of Richard II. And if you've read Shakespeare's Richard II, that duel is one of the first big conflicts that kind of sets everything off. And so, you know, you can read that part of the play, you can read what people were thinking about poison, and you can read about how courtiers behaved. And so it's a way of situating Hester within a much larger world. So that's my favorite part, is that you can read a poem about an eclipse and then go and read about early modern astronomy as well. Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor, Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Every crate features an inspiring woman and her own unique story of why she's awesome, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on STEAM activities and more. And for our listeners, if you go to girlscancrate.com, C-R-A-T-E dot com, and enter the code HERNAME, you'll get 20% off your first crate on any subscription. Check them out now at girlscancrate.com and make sure that you use the code her name, not what's her name, her name, all one word, so they know we sent you. The two women that started this project are scholars and much like you and Katie, it was a collaboration that came out of fascination with the subject. Wendy Wall is a professor of English at Northwestern University. She works on manuscript recipes in the 17th century. And Leah Knight is also a professor of English at Brock University in Canada. And she studies early modern gardens and writing. And together, Leah and Wendy decided that Hester needed to be available because the published edition of her works is out of print. And so it's $300 on Amazon, which means that no one can read Hester. And so Northwestern has been building the digital infrastructure and the digital home for this project. The project has collaborated with the University of Leeds Brotherton Library, where Hester Poulter's manuscript is housed. So we have people from throughout the US and Canada. Uh, a lot of scholars in Australia have been helping us, and we're always looking for more. A few more will go up every month or so. And that's been the greatest thing for me in helping promote this, this project, is to see, one, how excited people are about when you tell them the story, we've never heard of this woman and now she exists. But also how relevant her works seem to be to people. You know, she's writing about political conflict and scientific discovery, and these are things that are occupying our minds now. For you are of a variable condition, as well as I, and shall ere long dissolve. Glory not, then, in interposition, for into other elements revolve you must, perhaps by condensation. Hinder not, then, so poor a contentation. An excerpt from The Eclipse. The style of her poetry feels very fresh and modern. A lot of 17th century poetry you read and, you know, trying to get students to care oh, yeah. about 17th century poetry yeah. is really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's so <laughs> opaque. It's so hard yeah. to get into. And hers are not. Huh. They're still using, you know, 17th century language and even formats, but they feel very fresh, very accessible, very modern. She's writing about science huh. and about scientific curiosity and philosophical quandaries in a very sort of open, curious, huh. non-dogmatic way. Is that, do you think, because she was only writing for herself? Like, is she the type who's just writing to think through things? Or are there any signs that she intended to publish them? That's what's really interesting is that we have no idea. Mm. The reason that we have her manuscript is because someone made a fair copy of huh. her work. So 
That means someone took her work that she had written and wrote it down better, yeah. more beautifully, and officially bound it yeah. into a bound volume. So that means it was serious enough that this was a bound copy. Mm -hmm. She's not writing in secret. Hmm. She or someone values her writing enough to make a very beautiful, huh. fair copy of all of her work. Yeah. But we've never found another one. There isn't any evidence that this was being circulated. Yeah. And it doesn't look like extremely well used. This wasn't, the family wasn't poring over this and writing notes in the margins. Yeah. So. Intriguing. Who made this? Did her husband say, this is wonderful. Yeah. I want to make a copy. Did she decide this? Did her children? Someone found it valuable. She seems to have written exclusively for, her, for herself, maybe for her family members. But it is an interesting model, given what we know of how other women wrote in that, that time period. You know, we have, on one hand, Margaret Cavendish, who was right. all about making a reputation as a writer and insisted on being published. But most women wrote, you know, for their own pleasure. And many women would instruct their partners or their husbands or their children to destroy their writing after their death because to write publicly was still seen as kind of a mark against your virtue. So Hester is this, as you said, this strange middle ground where she values her writing and it seems that her family values it, but she shows no interest in, in moving beyond her local circle. Then gracious God, in thee I'll trust, although thou crumble me to dust. No grief shall so emergent be to separate my soul from thee. Of nothing thou didst me create, and shouldst thou now annihilate, abrupt, or consummate my story. Oh, let it be unto thy glory. An excerpt from The Circle. We are right here in Margaret Cavendish territory. We're a little before Margaret Cavendish. She's a bit older. Okay. But this is the exact same problem. <laughs> With the they Civil are War? They royalists. Uh -huh. And here comes the Civil War. Yeah. The king is beheaded, and they were the king's friends. The same thing that made her miserable, this isolation, her husband's withdrawal from the court, withdrawal from society, mm -hmm. keeps them safe. Oh, they're royalists, but he's not participating. He's not a threat. And so they just are left alone. Oh, that's nice. The safety of mediocrity. Exactly. But other people in Hester's family were parliamentarians and they were opponents of the king. Her sister, in fact, was one of the opponents of the king and was a next door neighbor to John Milton. Her nephews were royalists. And so her family even was split between this conflict and Hester writes a lot about her sadness and, and grief and anguish at the violence that was tearing the country apart. She has a number of poems mourning and condemning the beheading of Charles I. So she writes a lot about the fact that, you know, these rich men are tearing her country apart, grasping at power. She lost relatives. There was family conflict. She watched her country tearing itself apart. And so it's absolutely still affected her life. So she wrote everything under a pen name, and we're not, again, not sure why, but that was fairly common for women. But if you're just writing it for your family... Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm it, it's so weird. confusing. It's back and forth. Huh. But the pen name may have also just been a joke. So she, her manuscript is titled Poems Breathed Forth by the Noble Hadassus, <laughs> which is Esther, Queen Esther oh, from the Bible. Okay. And we know that Esther was a pen name that many women in this time period especially used as a sort of excuse for why they were doing this unladylike thing of writing, mm -hmm. especially if they're writing about politics or engaging in men's fields, because Queen Esther was allowed to engage politically when it was an emergency. Oh, okay. And so <laughs> because there's a civil war, oh, yeah. it's our moral responsibility as women. Yeah. Emergency. Women's voices needed. Exactly. Okay. So so that may have been just her way of saying... It's okay. It's an emergency. I know I'm not supposed to be writing these, but here's why I am. Okay. But yeah. Like posturing, too, saying, I have a classical education. I know about Esther yeah, and exactly. I know her fancier names. So... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like something public. Yeah. 
And her poems are full of Greek mythology and biblical knowledge and a really high level of engagement with the classical education world. Oh, I like that. And that yeah. seems to indicate a bit of ambition beyond the domestic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, many of my students are stunned to discover that women's ambitions and women's yeah. pursuits and jobs and academia and all these things didn't start in 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> Women were always doing these yep. things. <laughs> and that always. the idea that you have to pick one or the other is modern and silly <laughs> too. That women have always done both yeah. science and babies. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what's interesting about Hester Poulter and it seems the rest of the Poulter family is that Hester, at least, in addition to being a mother and a wife and having part of her identity be there, she also just seems to live life and engage in intellectual pursuits for her own pleasure because she believes it's a worthy pursuit. And that's not something that we have a contemporary model for. We often think that, you know, women in the past, if they were wives and mothers, they were either like fully wives and mothers. And if they did anything else, they became that other identity. And Hester at least through her poetry, seems to achieve balance and seems to achieve a complex and multifaceted identity where she is a wife and mother and housewife, but she's also a scholar and a poet, and none of these are contradictory. Yeah, I think labeling someone a proto-feminist is kind of the same kind of misapprehension of where we are today. Like, no. we have feminists now, but in the past, there never were any, but we could maybe pick right. out a couple of proto-feminists, you know, but there have been women who believe right. in equality in every time period <laughs> and everywhere in the world. We didn't invent it. We weren't the first ones <laughs> to notice new. that stuff wasn't fair. <laughs> no. She was, you know, she was ahead of ahead of her time i again i don't know if the ahead of her time label makes a lot of sense because it's it, out it, of her time i mean she's yeah sort of disengaged from yeah in in like a physical sense from what's going on so she's and that disengagement allows her to think more freely i think you know because she's not smack in the middle of london society she can she can probe at the boundaries of what is a rule and what is a societal expectation a bit more than she would have perhaps if she were in society with her sister. Hester spent a lot of time thinking about God and faith, and she wasn't afraid to question her faith. You do see her walking through steps of, I have questions, I have doubts, but she always returns to, but I must trust that God is just or that he will take care of me. And so she, you know, she, she does do these theological, as Milton says, justifying the ways of God to man. But these, and all the fixed orbs of light, shall be involved once more in horrid night. Like robes, the elements shall folded lie in the vast wardrobe of eternity. Then, my unsettled soul, be more resolved, seeing all this universe must be dissolved. An excerpt from Universal Dissolution. So, because she's isolated, they're kept physically safe. And she has the intellectual safety and freedom to do everything. Mm. I mean, the comparisons to Margaret Cavendish are really obvious and I think fair. But she also reminds me so much of Emily de Chatelet that she's she's observing the natural world. Mm. She's writing about science. She's writing about astronomy. She's writing about alchemy. Ah. And as we read her poems, it's very clear that she was continuing to read mm. incredibly complicated and unladylike sources of information and education cool. that are just really astounding. The scholar that wrote her first edition of poetry, Alice Erdley, says that although Hester writes a lot about her, her grief at her isolation, Erdley also thinks that it produced the poems that are so fresh and personal and really modern sounding. Because she was so free to do whatever she wanted, no one was going to check in on her um, it allowed her to be really experimental and to create these works that seem free of a lot of the confinements that much of the poetry of the 17th century has. Really, no matter what you're teaching, there's a Hester Poulter poem for it. If you want to do a unit on science, she's got all sorts of 
natural philosophy poems. If you want to do childbirth and domestic stuff, she has a lot of poems about that. Political stuff, religious stuff. She's a woman of all trades, really. She goes out and observes the ants and writes poems about ant behavior. Yeah. She's informed and wildly mm. curious. Maybe she was trying to convince herself that it's good being in isolation. Right. Look at all these things I can if do. If I'm isolated, yes, I'm look what I can do. Yeah. She divides them into poems and emblems, and her poems are often about political and religious subjects. Her emblems are bonkers. They're often about things in the natural world or myths. And so she has a poem about something called the cataplep or cataplepe. It's this mythical creature that can't lift its head, so it always looks down. And so she turns it into this meditation on how the cataplepe is a good mother but can never move its head. She writes about the cataplep several times, and no one knows what a cataplep is. <laughs> they, there's some weird stuff in the emblems, and wow. it's fascinating. There's a poem about a Russian bear chasing a peasant up a tree. There's <laughs> poems about porcupines. And she has another brilliant one where two, essentially two snake oil salesmen get in a battle and the magistrate rules that they each get to poison the other one. And then whichever one can make an antidote to save themselves, that's how they'll prove ah. that they're actually a good doctor ah. healer. Cool. <laughs> they're just... They're so wild. These poems are unlike anything that I've seen from this time period and just so incredibly creative and imaginative in cool. ways that are really fun. Thus, being in my fancy raised so far, this world appeared to me another star. And as the moon a shadow casts and light, so is our earth the empress of their night. Excerpt from This Was Written When I Lay With My Son, 1648. From a literary perspective, it's amazing because it's so different than anything else that anyone is writing mm -hmm. this time frame. From a history perspective, it's also really fascinating because you have her writing about the Civil War while it's happening kind of like live reporting as it happened, or, or nearly live. She, you know, she's writing poetry, she's writing elegies for the king right in the middle of when it's happening. And so for us, it's a record of a really violent and unstable time. But for her, it was a way of thinking about, like, here are these tragic events that are happening, how do I cognitively process them? Samantha Snively said she would have been live tweeting Ah. the Civil War ah. now. Like, she's keeping up day to day mm -hmm. on what's going on. Hmm. And we have this really unique perspective from someone who is deeply connected and inside, but also very removed hmm. and able to be completely honest yeah. about what she believes and what she sees happening. Hmm. She writes, she complains a lot in her poems about isolation. And I use complain in its older sense, not in its, you know, in, in all the attachments about like women talking about unjust things that we have turned it into today. Mm -hmm. But a complaint in that like sorrow at a particular station in life. She does complain a lot about her isolation, but at the same time, she will often write and pray to God to find contentment. And she also seems to take pleasure in many of the things that living in the country afford her. You know, the ability to go out into the garden and observe the flowers and to have these imaginative worlds built around what the flowers might say to each other and to go for a walk and observe ants and observe animals and, and learn about their behavior. I think we often think that you have to pick one side, right? If Hester Poulter was isolated, she must have had to hate it. I, I think she, she, achieved, she tried to achieve balance and contentment. She was heavily isolated. It was very sad. And she still t seems to be trying to make the best of it. She gets genuine pleasure in her house in the country, even as it cuts her off from other things she would like. And that's not too shabby for a woman in 17th century England. Not at all. To land in, this is sad, but look at all these great things. Like, that's a pretty good life yeah. for 17th century England. And somewhat universal. This is sad, but look at all these good things. Carolyn Hacks once wrote something that sticks with me for Hester. She said, every 
choice you make comes with sorrow for the other choices you couldn't have. I'm paraphrasing really badly, but this, this seems to me to be a useful way of thinking about Hester Poulter. To the extent that she had choices in who she married, she seems to have walked down the middle of the path pretty well. She chose certain things and had sorrow about the life she couldn't have, but she also made the best of it and made her little world where she was. And it's because she's so isolated that she can invent this totally new way of doing what she's doing. Yeah. Be free. Yeah. Which I think is really fascinating because in general, I think, we'll see what you think. I think in general, art is better in community. Like the people who are brilliant Mm. and create the best stuff are usually doing that by being in a community of other really brilliant people and pushing Mm -hmm. against each other, right? The Beatles are better together than they would be apart. And the Pre-Raphaelites do much better work when they're around other people than when they're off on their own. Yeah. But what about Vincent Van Gogh? Right. So there's these outliers, and, and they are often the ones who are breaking totally new ground, right? Doing something no one else has done. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a literary Darwinism, maybe? (laughs) That when you're on an island, you Uh. can adapt really (laughs) fast. You're cut off. Mutations can happen really fast. Yeah. When you're off, cut off from the rest of the animals. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you don't need the community then. Or yeah, and so both, I wonder, both like equally interesting, and I think it probably is dependent on what what you're doing, right? You can make wildly creative original jumps mm-hmm. on an island, but maybe you can't push the field oh. to the peak, right? Yeah, that you get better at the thing, pushing against other people who are really good at the thing. Mm-hmm. But when you break out of the thing, you can do that by yourself. Yeah. Hester Poulter just goes, nah, and jumps the fence. Yeah. That's my style. I really like that. (laughs) Jumping the fence? Yeah. I just, I'm a big fan of going, nope, just going to do my own thing over here. (laughs) (laughs) That seems accurate. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe it's interesting because you maybe love the... Well, you love the Pre-Raphaelites just because you love their style. But you you are more of like a community, group, society type of person, right? And I'm yeah. more of the, nope, I'm just over here going to do my thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah and I so think that's why it's interesting. All the answers are correct. Yeah. And all the ways are fine. We need them all. <laughs> we need people in communities doing cool stuff. And we need people saying, nope, I'm going to be over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely no, I'm definitely a person that would never accomplish the stuff. I need the team mm. of people yeah. caring about the thing that I care about and push yeah. off each other. And, and you're an island. Together. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, an isolated house in the middle of nowhere sounds awesome. <laughs> I was gonna say that's your dream. Yep. Yes, please. I was just telling a friend that I, on my list of things to do someday, is to attend a silent monastic retreat Mm. in an abbey somewhere and she's a good enough friend that she didn't worry about bursting out laughing (laughs) at the idea and saying i'm just the idea of you not talking for a week is i want to be there and see that happen can i be a fly on the wall you're just going to be trying to talk to everyone (laughs) with your eyes yeah you'll definitely resort to sign language like monks did in the middle ages So, because this is an internal question for me, too, you know, what's more important? Mm -hmm. Being happy or making productive creative output or changing the world? For the sake of argument, if it really were a choice between one or the other for humanity, I would go with happiness. Yeah, I I would, too. I think ethically we have to. Let's be happy and not make stuff because yeah. life that's happy is worth living <laughs> that sounds really simple yeah. when you put it that See way how simple it is <laughs> worked it out there you go <laughs> done everybody just be happy 
Philosophy solved. <laughs> For I no liberty expect to see, until to atoms I dispersed be. Then being enfranchised, free as my verse, I shall surround this spacious universe, until by other atoms thrust and hurled, we give a being to another world. Excerpt from Why Must I Thus Forever Be Confined? Huge thanks to Samantha Snively and the Poulter Project. If you'd like to learn more about Hester Poulter, you can find links to the Poulter Project, pictures, and more, as well as all of the music for this episode at whatsyournamepodcast.com. Thank you also to our sponsors for this episode, Chantel Oliver and Andrea Ferguson. We couldn't do what we do without our sponsors. If you'd like to become a sponsor of What's Her Name, visit our website at whatshernamepodcast.com and click donate. You can get great thank you gifts like trading cards, cross-stitch patterns, and even your own thank you shout out in a future episode. Music for this episode was provided by Mark Nelson, Kira Zeman Rugen, and Solis Camarada. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle. This episode is sponsored by The Process, a creative docu-series. How do you capture the power of creativity? In a new video docu-series, Filmmaker Daniel Foster Smith interviews artists, makers, and other creatives to understand how they move through the artistic process and overcome creative blocks. Go to danielfostersmith.com and start streaming episodes today.